Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, on behalf of the European Parliament Intergroup on Climate Change, Biodiversity and Sustainable Development, I'm very happy to welcome you all to today's webinar, where we'll be addressing sustainable mobility, powering climate action. Uh, before I kick off, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank MEP Ms. Maria Spiraki for hosting today's discussion, as well as colleagues from EDF for kindly co-organizing today's event. Uh, prior to passing the floor, I would like to invite our audience to send us your questions during the event. So in order to do that, you can use the Q&A's box, uh, which should pop up at the right uh, top of your screen. Over there, you can use your, uh, all panelists' options. Uh, please also make sure to indicate the speaker to whom your question is best addressed so that we can facilitate a fruitful discussion before you. So once again, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, Ms. Piraki, you have the floor. Well, thank you, Elias. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining this event. Excuse us for the delay. Sometimes technical prog problems are occurred here in the Parliament. Well, as you all know, mobility and transport matters to all of us. And it is my great pleasure to host this event today on sustainable mobility in view of the recently published commission communication of the European uh, of the European sustainable smart mobility strategy. Uh, in this regard, and under my capacity as the co-chair of the Intergroup on Climate Change and Sustainable Development of the European Parliament, I feel very honored for having here, not exactly here, but in, in the web, uh, actors representing the mobility sector from all different perspectives, as well as colleagues from the Parliament with significant background on the sector in order to exchange our views and have a fruitful discussion. Starting with free movement of people and goods across our internal borders, because it is a fundamental activity and of course it is a fundamental freedom for the European Union and our single market. Traveling in the EU has led to greater cohesion and segment European identity as the second largest area of expenditure for European households. The transport sectors contribute 5% to the European GDP and directly employs around 10 million workers. By far, the most serious challenges facing the transport sector today is to significantly reduce its emission and become more sustainable. This is the case. At the same time, this transformation offers great opportunities for better quality of life and for European, uh, for European industry across the value chain. First of all, to modernize the, the, transport, the transport sector and of course, to create high quality jobs. For, for us in the European Parliament, I think it is important also to strengthen competitiveness and pursue global leadership as other markets are moving fast toward, us, toward zero emission mobility. The European Green Deal calls, as you all know, for a 90% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions for transport in order for the EU to become a climate neutral economy by 2050 while also working towards a zero pollution ambition. To achieve this systemic change, as the Commission underlined in the communication which published recently, we need to make all transport modes more sustainable. We need also to make sustainable alternatives wide, alternatives wide uh, available in a more multiple transport system. And I mean sustainable alter alternatives fuel, of course. And it is important also to, to go ahead, head by head, uh, to put in place the right incentives to, ride, to, to drive the transition. It is our duty to ensure that our transport system is truly resilient against future crises and we receive, learned a lot of lessons during this period. Completing the single European transport area as envisioned by 2011 white paper still remains a cornerstone in the European transport policy fostering cohesion, reducing regional disparities, as well as improving connectivity and access to the internal market for all regions remains strategic importance for the EU. The COVID-19 pandemic has a significant impact on mobility. In the context of recovery of this crisis, public support should help mobility build back better and leap forward to a sustainable and smarter future. Greening mobility must be the new license for, for the transport sector to grow. Mobility in Europe should be based on an efficient and interconnected multimodal transport system for both passengers and freight. 
enhanced by an affordable high-speed rail network, by abundant recharging and refueling infrastructure for zero-emission vehicles, and supply for renewable and low-carbon fuels, by cleaner and more active mobility in greener cities that contribute to the good health and well-being for our people. We also need to use digitalization and automation to further increase the levels of safety, security, reliability and comfort, thereby maintaining the EU's leadership in, trans in transport, equipment, manufacturing and services, and improving our global competitiveness through efficient and resilient logistic chains. This evolution should leave nobody behind, and it is also important. It is crucial that mobility is available and affordable for all. Rural areas, urban areas, especially for rural areas that remote regions better connected, the, the new transport must be accessible for persons with reduced mobility and persons with disabilities, and the new transport, the, the, the new sector transport, must offer good social condition, reskilling opportunities, and provide attractive jobs to the workers. The European pillar of social rights in this regard is the European compass to make sure that green and digital transitions are socially fair and just. I would like to, to, to conclude this, this intervention by, by saying a few things on, on the work that we are doing here in the Parliament. Another important element is the revision of the Trans-European Transport Network, the well-known 10T guidelines, which is expected to be voted in the next plenary session uh, here in the Parliament. The main points of the revision are the following, and I would like to, to, to tape them in order to, to, to further discuss on them during our, our, our session. There are no major changes, as you know, to the maps until core networks is complete and it is, it is of paramount importance. However, limited adjustments to the 10T in order to reflect the development of transport networks to improve connectivity among different corridor, corridors and to peripheral regions, and to reinforce cross-border rail connections are needed. We also prioritize here in the Parliament under the 10T the full deployment of alternative fuels, and I think that is one of the of the most important aspects to discuss. Uh, we also say that the EU roadmap for road infrastructure should be aligned with the automotive industry roadmap for infrastructure investments and to go hand in hand with vehicle production, new vehicle production, especially production that, uh, of vehicles that they are using uh, alternative fuels, that they are using renewable energy. We will also boot, boost the innovative digital application in all modes. We are trying to, to facilitate the establishment of systems of information. That means that systems that uh, they, they are monitoring vessels trafficking and information systems that they are monitoring rivers, air traffic management systems, and monitoring systems for the structural health of infrastructure. It is also important, but because we are now discussing on infrastructure, which are mostly paid by, by European taxpayers' money. Concerning member states, the member states which have not yet sufficiently aligned their national transport plans and programs with the objective of 10T shall address this shortcoming without any further delay. A roadmap of uh, the implementation of uh, the rail freight corridors should be financed through the new project of European common interest and, of course, under recovery and resilience facility, which is our, our new huge instrument in order to overcome uh, the European economy from the crisis. We have also uh, to, to provide seamless cross-border rail transport on the 10 net, on the 10T network and along the European frail, freight uh, corridors, and we, sh we call for mandatory cross-border cooperation among infrastructure managers. We also call the Commission to put forward binding measures for infrastructure managers as part of 10T review, and we would like to call also for a roadmap of island waters development to be financed through a project of European common interest in order to, to break the, the isolation of a lot of islands. Recently, we start discussing on the 10E regulation, and so we are discussing 10E, a 10T regulation. So concerning the 10T regulation, pipelines are not only seen as a part of the energy infrastructure, but also as an enabler of the transition towards more sustainable transport, connecting industry clusters and transport hubs, transporting commodities, implementing the carbonization technologies. Last but not least, we aim to increase synergies between defense needs and 10T 
with the overall aim of improving military mobility across the EU. It is also important to understand that we must shift the existing paradigms and we have to, to transform the, the, the transportation sector and to provide a sustainable and smart future. Once again, thank you very much for your participation and your attention, and your attention here and looking forward to exchange views in, in our meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Piraki, for setting the scene with regards to today's discussions. Uh, following next is uh, Mr. Gerald Reuters on behalf of the European Commission. Uh, so, Mr. Reuters is the Director of Directorate B at the Mobility and Transport DG of the European Commission since 2017, uh, notably as well uh, maintaining his role as Head of Unit responsible for uh, TNT for the Trans-European uh, Network mentioned by Ms. Piraki. So, Mr. Reuters, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I hope you hear me well. And uh, I would like to uh, greet uh, Mrs. Piraki for her excellent introduction. You have made my work uh, even more easy because you have been so, uh, let's say, focused already on, on what is ongoing in the Commission, of course, with regard to the new communication that is putting forward the strategy, but also a number of the files that are going to come very soon. So thank you, Ms. Spiraki, for that. And I say, I, I'm quite sure that also uh, afterwards, Mr. Artuk will certainly react because you spoke about the TNT, with his, which he is very familiar, or Alberto Mazzola because of the European Year of Rail, also a team that you have been highlighting. Uh, dear uh, colleagues, uh, dear audience, uh, from my side, uh, I would like to stress that this commission that started to work on the 1st of December 2019 has been putting forward a Green Deal already in its first weeks. And in 2020, has been building upon that communication with a very clear climate law and a climate pact, uh, and uh, thereby, by the end of the year, could uh, also then propose this new uh, strategy for a sustainable and smart mobility. And uh, it coincided perfectly fine just ahead of the conclusion of the uh, MFF and also the agreement between Parliament and Council on the climate tracking in the MFF and on the uh, whole package that was uh, brought forward in the end of the year. I therefore think we have a perfect starting base to lay out what has been put forward in this new strategy. The new strategy, ladies and gentlemen, is putting forward three key objectives. We need to make European transport more sustainable, more smart and resilient. There are 10 flagship areas proposed in the strategy with key milestones very clearly uh, highlighting what should be done until 2030 and until 2050. And it is also accompanied by an action plan with 82 specific concrete policy actions and a staff working document that is describing in detail what had been done in the past, also in the light of the 2011 white paper. So this uh, is a, a very comprehensive that is not only targeting transport measures, but the complexity of all measures that are needed also in other areas. And when you call Mrs. Piraki on synergies, for instance, with energy or with climate, or with other areas, then this is exactly what is being done. And I would like to stress that uh, when we propose measures to come this year, like you were highlighting yourself, the 10T, then the 10T will not come alone. As indicated by you, there is also a 10E proposal. We will also pair it together with an urban mobility package with an ITS proposal with the rail freight corridors that you mentioned. Or when we come forward uh, earlier in the year, in, in June probably, with a 55% package, it will not only deal, deal with the alternative fuel infrastructure directive mentioned by you, but also by the related CO2 legislation, the ETS, uh, the uh, Renewable Energy Directive, RED, uh, the uh, energy taxation, the quality and uh, the quality of buildings, and so forth. So. Uh, in both of the cases, whether it's the package of June or the one of September, we will be comprehensive. And being comprehensive will allow to really achieve, as you indicated, this very key objective of reducing uh, until 2050, 90% of the greenhouse gas emissions, and to make sure that the EU becomes a climate neutral continent. And milestones are clearly set in the, uh, in the strategy. Uh, until 2030, and I quote a few of them, 
uh, we should have uh, 30 million zero emission cars and 80,000 zero emission lorries in operation. We should have 100 climate neutral cities. We would see a doubling of high speed rail traffic and rail freight increase by 50%. And we would, of course, like to see increases also in inland waterways and short sea shipping because rail inland waterways and short sea shipping are the most environmentally friendly modes and it is uh, of course uh, as you said Ms. Spiraki not only that each mode individually should decarbonize but also that we should use uh, the backbone of public transport and of environmentally friendly modes to make uh, I would say a clear shift to those modes that can bear this very environmentally friendly traffic. Of course, it should also come with a uh, clear increase in the efficiency of our system and thereby smartening and making it more resilient. The European transport system has been hit very severely by the uh, crisis. And uh, as you said, we should build back better. And, uh, and that should allow to come uh, forward uh, with a sector when it is coming out of the crisis that is responding to the Green Deal and to the smartening of, uh, of the European transport. Um, I cite as a conclusion also a few of the milestones of 2050 and I will also address the point that you highlighted on the 10T. Uh, so also by 2050, uh, we have set certain milestones now because uh, it is in full compliance with the Green Deal. I cited those of 2030 and 2050. We think that nearly all cars, vans and buses and the new heavy duty vehicles can be zero emission. I spoke about rail freight. We hope to triple that by 2050. We hope also uh, we, to double, sorry, by 2050 and to triple the high speed. And we would like to see a 50% increase on inland waterways and short sea shipping by 2050. Uh, you addressed the Tanti network, Mrs. Piraki. Uh, the proposal from the Commission side will come forward in September, possibly to be seen after the impact assessment that is going on. Uh, you have an own initiative report under adoption in the Parliament right now, which is very welcomed by the Commission. Uh, because it's putting forward the right uh, key uh, points to be tackled. Um, the TNT will be also a carrier for the rollout of alternative fuel infrastructure, which will be tackled, of course, by the Alternative Fuel Infrastructure Directive. And the two will guarantee that there will be sufficient alternative fuel infrastructure available for all transport modes along all of the territory. Because I think that the Parliament will put a lot of value on the fact that there should be no gaps, that this alternative fuel infrastructure should be interoperable, and that there should be a smooth experience uh, of using that so that citizens can, everywhere in the Union, find these alternative fuels, pay them with their credit card, like they are filling, in, uh, the, filling their, their cars today with petrol or with, with benzene. Uh, as it is uh, in, 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 in current practice. We are fuel neutral. We are not uh, putting forward the one or the other fuel in particular. And so we should uh, be doing so uh, also in the, next, uh, in the next reiteration of the AFIT and the 10T. Um, I have been focusing on a few points given that we started a bit late. I remain here and I hope that this seminar will be a very good uh, introduction to the new uh, strategy. And I thank you, Mrs. Piraki and everyone for their contributions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you very much, Mr. Reuters, for your intervention, uh, specifically for highlighting not only the reasons behind, but also the vision and the concrete measures ahead with regards to rendering uh, EU transport more sustainable more smart and definitely more resilient as well. Uh, moving on with today's agenda, our next speaker is uh, Mr. Dubois uh, on behalf of EDF. Mr. Dubois is the Director of Development and Strategic Partnerships at the Electric Mobility Division of the F uh, EDF Group since 2018. So I think it's uh, an intervention we're all very much looking forward. Uh, Mr. Dubois, you have the floor. Good afternoon. Can you see me? Yeah. 
Uh, first of all, my best wishes uh, to all of you for, for this new, new year. Uh, I also want to thank you for the invitation that gave me the opportunity to, to present EDF activities in the e-mobilities. Uh, in fact, EDF started to invest in electric mobility more than 20 years ago. And it's only in 2018 that we decided to launch a strategic uh, uh, e-mobility plan. And that is an ambitious strategy for EDF to become the energy company that will be the leader of e-mobility in France, the UK, Italy, and, and Belgium. Uh, you can see on the slide a, a kind of ecosystem that we are, we are, we are developing. We have developed Isivia, that is an EDF subsidiary that uh, operates more than 10,000 charging points in France and provides consumer access to more than 100,000 charging points in Europe, thanks to roaming, thanks to the Easy Via Pass. And one year ago, you can see on the, in, on the UK map, you can see that we also acquired PodPoint, uh, one of the largest EV charging companies in the UK. Uh, today, we offer solution for each EV driver in all situations, public charging, businesses, uh, residential customers. We offer the supply of electricity, of course, we, the deployment and the operation of charging infrastructures and, and also related services, and in particular, smart charging. Uh, we also propose consulting services for B2B customers to help them optimizing their switch to the switch of their fleets to, to electric. We also uh, have developed uh, an entire ecosystem of players, uh, what, uh, what is displayed on the slide. We partner with large companies, large car makers or leasing company, but also with many startups. We are really convinced that strong partnerships are key to accelerate the development with innovative services. These services include, for example, uh, new services such as shared or connected parking or car sharing, but also vehicle to grid technologies to optimize the charge while creating value and also providing some flexibility to the power grid. For, for vehicle to grid, we also launched uh, beginning of 2019, a new company that you can see on, on the slide called Drive, together with the American startup uh, Nubi. We also launched a, a company called Dynamics that is also displayed on the slide. It's a new company in order to produce hydrogen with low carbon electricity and in order to promote low carbon hydrogen to decarbonize transport segments such as long distance or heavy transportation. It will be a complement to, to direct electrification. Reaching carbon neutrality by 2050 and a 55% in CO2 emission by 2030 definitely requires more ambitious in the, in the transport sector. An ambition that is embraced by the Commission in its smart and sustainable mobility strategy. Building a better and sustainable future for mobility implies a significant transformation to rethink our, our approaches and to develop smart intermodal and shared mobility solutions, including, I also mentioned, car and parking sharing or optimization of the public transportation. It obviously requires to switch to clean and easy, easily uh, chargeable cars as well. Uh, on building on our experience, we know that direct electrification is the most efficient way to reach ambitious targets of reduction of green gas house emission in the road transport. This is due to the fact that EV uh, uses three times less energy per kilometer than a, a traditional car. Recent and independent studies on life cycle assessment concluded that over its lifetime, a battery electric vehicle emits 50% less CO2 than an average car in the EU today. These studies are, are shared by TNE, that is on, on the panel I can see. Uh, this trend will continue to improve with the decarbonization of the energy mix that is also a target of the EU. And in terms of use, the current average uh, driving range of an EV is also improving. It's about around uh, 300 kilometers today. It will have to uh, 400 kilometers in 2030. EV market share tripled last year and should even and should be around 15, 20 percent this year. 
and in 2030 up to 40 to 50 million of EV will be on the road. This obviously uh, must go together with an uh, adequate, adequate uh, rollout of charging infrastructure so that all users can have access to easy and affordable charging solutions. EDF Group will of course contribute to the necessary boost of EV charging points rollout. The EU can also play a major role to foster this, de this deployment. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, first, it requires a coherent set of changes to the existing 2030 leg legislative framework needed to provide long-term market visibility. Just like we have binding targets for CO2, for CO2 performance standard, which proved efficient to boost EV sales, we need now binding targets for charging points so that EV drivers can charge easily everywhere. The revision of the Alternative Fuel Infrastructure Directive should tackle this. Ambitious, tar ambitious binding targets at member states level in terms of charging points deployment will provide market visibility and will send a strong signal to investors. A qualitative approach is also required to ensure that charging points, of course, are well located according to customer demand in order to, get to tackle range anxiety and also in order to adapt charge power to the diversity of needs. Public charging is one part of the challenge. Private charging at home is another battle. In terms of course, of course, there is uh, access and handiness. The best charging point is the one you can have at home. There are no real obstacles to get the equipment when you live in a private house but you know that it's much more complicated for multi-dwelling housings. This should be addressed in the energy performance of buildings directive. We need ambitious targets for private EV charging. It requires the development, it, it requires, for example, the right incentive to facilitate the rollout of charging points in buildings. It could be, for example, an effective right to plug, so to say, for each EU citizen, or it could be minimum requirement in terms of cabling or pre-cabling. Second, public transport, pe second public support is required to boost investment in promising and innovative technologies such as smart charging and vehicle to grid. Uh, while transport is among the most impacted sectors by the current uh, pandemic, its recovery will demand huge investment in the coming years. This does represent an opportunity to shift towards a greener and a smarter mobility system. By 2030, we expect the public charging services to be sufficient to have a competitive market. But in the meantime, a minimum network needs to be put in place and still does require public intervention. By 2030, we also expect the mobility value chain to be almost fully digital and to provide flexibility services to the power grid with smart charging and vehicle to grid technologies. Uh, next slide, please. 50 million EVs in Europe in 2030 could represent a huge, a huge potential of storage of more than 3,000 gigawatt. -er. It represents something like two to three times more than all hydraulic storage capacities in Europe which are today the only competitive way to store electricity. Even using a very small fraction of it would help the integration of new energy sources, and it will lead to a cost-efficient decarbonization of both energy and transport sector. EDF intends to be a key player in this energy V2G market. And as an example, we recently launched with public and private partners an ambitious project in the south of France that is called Flexitan. The EU can play its part to bring this technology at a larger scale by supporting wider pilot projects across the EU. The, le the legislation, for, of course, should also ensure all stakeholders can have access to the data of the vehicles. Indeed, smart charging will rely on key data of the vehicle, such as batteries, state of charge or general health status. 
the charging point operators will need to have access to this data. To conclude, you understood that EDF strongly supports electromobility to achieve a full decarbonization of transport. To learn and lead by example, in 2017, EDF joined the EV100 initiative. This means that we have started to switch our fleet of 40,000 light vehicles to electric vehicles. Today at EDF, EV accounts more than 11% of EDF fleet. Our objective is to have 100% of EV by 2030. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Dubois, for your uh, insightful presentation. Elias, if I may. Yes, please. Uh, and thank you very much. Uh, uh, it's not my purpose to interrupt, but I think that we have to to underline the proposal concerning barred targets for charging uh, for charging points. I fully insist on this, and uh, here in the Parliament, we fully agree with your proposal, Mr. Dubois because it is important to facilitate people to have access to, to, to recharging their, their, their cars, their vehicles, and it is also important to encourage people to this transformation. Thank you very much once again for your participation. Thanks, Peter Siaki. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Dubra, Ms. Piraki. Um, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Uh, Georgios Kovras, uh, on behalf of uh, Thessaloniki Urban Transport Organization where Dr. Skodras is the president and CEO. Uh, moreover, Dr. Skodras is also a professor in Novel and Clean Energy Technologies at the University of Western Macedonia. So, Dr. Skodras, we're uh, looking forward to your intervention. Thank you very much. Please allow me to share presentation. We have... Okay. Preparing right now. Um, Thank you, uh, Mrs. Spiraki and their associates uh, for uh, this kind invitation today and, uh, the uh, and the opportunity to present what is going on in, in uh, Thessaloniki. Uh, some uh, general comments about the uh, urban transportation, uh, public urban transportation, uh, which is uh, an essential parameter for the operation of modern cities. Uh, on financial and social uh, level. Also, the public uh, urban transportation systems are more important for the low income strata of the, of the society. Uh, and uh, you, you can see uh, the results of a poll in uh, opinion poll in Thessaloniki. So, ha half of the population uh, uses on a daily basis. Uh, uh, public buses uh, for uh, uh, its uh, its commutes. This uh, makes the importance of uh, uh, urban public uh, transport more uh, more bold. And uh, please allow me to express the uh, the opinion that uh, following the previous policies on electricity, urban transport, uh, public urban transport, uh, should be characterized as a universal service. And uh, this uh, will uh, result that the member states should provide the baseline services, baseline level services to every resident at an affordable cost. Uh, I think this will uh, uh, promote uh, the, uh, the efficient operation of the public uh, urban uh, transport uh, systems. As for uh, our company, we are providing services in the uh, area of Thessaloniki, the Thessaloniki prefecture, prefecture in the north part uh, of Greece. Uh, on the right side of uh, the slide, you can see uh, the uh, urban complex of Thessaloniki and the near urban complex areas. Uh, this uh, uh, butterfly shape of uh, Thessaloniki uh, introduced uh, specific difficulties in designing uh, and uh, operating. Uh, a public urban transport uh, system. Uh, anyway, our area is the second uh, largest urban cluster in Greece after Athens. Uh, 1.2 uh, actual population in the area, and roughly the one third of the uh, country's uh, GDP is produced uh, in uh, our area. Uh, organ the organization I represent today has been established in 1957. Uh, according to the uh, tools and the uh, ideas uh, 
uh, they were uh, on the first line uh, at that uh, time. Uh, it was uh, consisting of uh, private uh, uh, shareholders, uh, personal persons uh, as shareholders, uh, and this uh, uh, status has been uh, unaltered, unaltered for 60 years. Uh, in 2017, uh, the company uh, was nationalized and it was meant to expire on uh, December 3rd, uh, 2019. However, uh, major issues have not been resolved and also uh, no, no actual uh, uh, solid actions have been undertaken for the next day. So the state decided to continue its operation till uh, the end of two, uh, at least uh, by the end of uh, 2022. Uh, thus the company operates continuously either efficiently or not for 63 uh, years. It was a real challenge uh, in uh, uh, in being appointed in that company since two year two years after its nationalization. Uh, the major issue was to secure the continuation of the operation in the uh, in the area because the fleet uh, was and is uh, still today uh, quite aged, extremely aged. Uh, Sixty percent of that was not operating. Uh, so the company could provide the services only to 40 to 60 percent of the assigned workload, uh, and also its uh, incomes have uh, had collapsed, they have been reduced, reduced by uh, 40 percent. So uh, this can clearly depicted in, in this scheme, uh, where you can see in comparison to the reference year to uh, 2008, uh, the uh, efficiency of the company in 2019. Uh, uh, comments in the case surveillance report uh, of the uh, EU have been included uh, for the uh, for us uh, because uh, uh, significant concern, concerns have been raised. Uh, in order to uh, to handle this situation, a crisis management plan was designed uh, and deployed. Uh, and actions have been undertaken uh, to, toward prolonging the towards the prolonging the lifetime of uh, the company, uh, the uh, the ability, the right to to lease buses, uh, and uh, also to handle the debts uh, to uh, the state to allow the company's uh, continuation operation. Uh, since we have uh, done that. Uh, now uh, we can see uh, the next steps, uh, which include uh, uh, the achieving of a sustainable and environmental friendly growth of public transport in the uh, area of Thessaloniki. Uh, of course, to support the country's efforts to comply with the EU uh, uh, directives for clean vehicles and clean uh, air act. Uh, to uh, improve the operational uh, needs uh, for the Athens and the, the Thessaloniki bus uh, systems. Uh, actions include uh, activities on restructuring the uh, OAST and also uh, bus uh, fleet replacement, uh, replacement action uh, plan, uh, which are uh, now in uh, progress. Uh, pro probably a new target uh, oriented uh, internal structure is uh, necessary. Electronic ticketing, the unified for all urban transport media in the Thessaloniki area. Uh, there is a, this is a huge uh, project funded uh, uh, by state funding for 30 million euros in order to fully digitize and upgrade, upgrade the telematics and fleet management uh, and the operation of the company uh, and the fuel handling. Uh, in order to obtain uh, the necessary uh, availability of fleet availability, uh, a hybrid solution has been applied by bus leasing, uh, including the uh, maintenance uh, uh, of the equipment. Uh, for the uh, fleet replacement uh, action plan, uh, there is a project in progress, uh, 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 controlled by the Ministry of Transport uh, of Greece, 
includes uh, both Athens uh, and uh, Thessaloniki. And uh, this has been assigned to uh, a group of uh, export companies. And it includes three tasks. Uh, first, the uh, action plan for the renewal uh, of uh, the fleet by 20, uh, 2030. Uh, the feasibility study for uh, purchasing uh, the buses and uh, last but not least uh, the technical uh, spe specification. Uh, therefore, uh, despite the problems, uh, I think we can uh, we are, uh, we can uh, gain the time uh, and cover the distance uh, that uh, makes us uh, being uh, uh, quite uh, in the past. Uh, however, there are some issues should be considered, uh, particularly for Thessaloniki, uh, which uh, is not equipped with natural gas uh, uh, buses, which uh, might be and could be the, the a transition uh, fuel uh, in order uh, prior to go to reaching the full electrification, and this should be considered and, and quoted. quoted. Uh, also, we have to keep in mind that we need the renewable electricity uh, because otherwise uh, we just transfer the problem to the west of Macedonia, who are the uh, coal uh, uh, fired electricity power plants uh, uh, of Greece uh, are located. Uh, issues exist also in the uh, for for the grid and uh, if it is. Uh, if the related uh, infrastructure is sufficient to cover uh, the demand. An initial survey we have done uh, a few months ago for the uh, uh, system in Thessaloniki, uh, it seems that it is uh, extremely marginal uh, to cover the demand on uh, the electricity uh, capacity. Uh, the cost of the electric buses and the related infrastructure for charging, etc., should be also uh, considering uh, because uh, till now uh, these costs uh, are quite high and uh, the financial models uh, are not uh, uh, are not giving so good uh, uh, results. Uh, also, uh, there is lack of experience and infrastructure, and the infrastructure uh, for electric buses maintenance and support. This is an important issue if we want to have an efficient and uh, well operating uh, public transport uh, system. Uh, definitely, uh, the future for our company is to, uh, to, to, con to keep its uh, public ca character at this uh, point uh, in order to resolve all the, uh, pro uh, the previous issues. Of course, uh, the country and, uh, of co and Thessaloniki also should be fully implement uh, the, EU, the EU regulation 1370. Uh, also, the state subsidies uh, should be min uh, minimized uh, since uh, urban transport systems might and should be economically uh, uh, viable. Uh, my personal opinion, opinion is uh, as long as uh, the restructure in the form of ASTA uh, is completed, it should be fully uh, privatized. Uh, in order to uh, achieve sufficient and proper operation in, in the future. Uh, however, the, the public opinion uh, in Thessaloniki is uh, strongly divided uh, uh, about the ownership of the uh, urban transport uh, system. So we have 20% uh, they reply it should be private, 32% uh, to be public, and 33% uh, 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 PPP, a public-private pa uh, uh, partnership. As for us, uh, also uh, the uh, opinions are quite divided. Uh, one third to be privatized, uh, one third to remain state-owned, uh, and, uh, and a quite significant percentage uh, that should be returned to the uh, old, the previous uh, shareholders. Uh, in any way, the last in the of the future of the tomorrow should be modern, digital, and environmentally sound. Uh, it should be passenger friendly and oriented. 
competent and efficient, productive and socially responsible, open to the society and the market, and uh, a tool for economic and social uh, development. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Skodras, for your intervention. It's, uh, it's with great pleasure to see how your uh, actions contribute to sustainable and uh, environment-friendly growth of uh, public transport in Greece. Uh, moving ahead with uh, today's agenda, it's with pleasure to introduce Mr. Uh, David Gridet, uh, who works as a senior manager at, uh, on European affairs at the European Business Aviation Association uh, for uh, EBAA. So it will be with pleasure to also hear more from uh, Mr. Rivet on uh, the aviation considerations uh, with regards to today's discussions. Uh, Mr. Rivet, you have the floor. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you, you hear me and you see my presentation. Yeah, there is just an issue here. I would like to put it in full screen. Voila. Um, so first of all, uh, I would like to thank Mrs. Piraki and the Intergroup for inviting the European Business Aviation Association to join this important debate. Uh, very often we are debating and exchanging on those topics with the usual aviation and transport policy makers and regulators. Speaking today in front of the intergroup gives us a unique chance to expand the scope of our audience and raise awareness on what our sector does to reduce its environmental impact and what are our ambitions for the, the future. I would like also to, to thank Mrs. Piraki because she said at the beginning of her opening, free movement is a fundamental right in the EU. And it's true that um, we should not forget about it, uh, even if this right is often, often suspended given the, the context we are living in. So very quickly, before I tell you more about uh, business aviation and sustainability, I'd like to start with what's EBAA and what's business aviation. EBA is the voice of, of the European business aviation sector. We are the leading organization for operators of business aircraft in Europe, which means companies operating non-scheduled or on-demand flights. We represent over 700 companies from across the entire value chain of the European business aviation sector, from airports to insurance companies or maintenance companies to operators. Our mission is to enable responsible, sustainable growth for business aviation, enhancing connectivity and creating opportunities. Now about our sector. We foster technical innovation and environmental stewardship across the full value chain. Business aviation contributes by 87 billion euros in turnover to the European economy. We provide around 300,000, 75,000 highly skilled jobs directly and indirectly. And we connect Europe through 1,400 airports, which means three times more than airlines. Now about uh, European business aviation and the climate crisis. The worldwide business aviation community continually seeks methods to reduce its environmental impact. For example, in the last 40 years, emissions from business aircraft have been reduced by half, 50%. There's also a significant plan to, uh, for sustainability to go further. The business aviation commitment on climate change and the STARS program. STARS program is a program designed to support the business aviation industry by helping to increase awareness of social and environmental issues and develop new standards for the future. We are also pioneers. Numerous new technologies such as winglets that you can see now on pretty much all new aircraft are business aviation innovation. For example, they reduce the fuel burn by three to 5% for Boeing 737, three to 5%. In 2009, the sector came together to sign on the business aviation commitment on climate change. The commitment is a guiding principle and foundation for all sustainability and env environmental activity within the business aviation se sector. It sets out three key goals and lays out four pathways to, to achieve them. So what are those goals? 
The first one is the improvement of fuel efficiency on average by 2% per year from 2010 until 2020. The second goal is about achieving carbon neutral growth from 2020 onwards. And the third goal is halving total CO2 emissions by 2050 relative to 2005. This is a global commitment and I will uh, go back to this commitment later on. How will we achieve that? We will achieve that by investment in new technology, by fly using more efficient operations, by building and using efficient infrastructures, and by using effective global market-based measures such as Corsia or ETS. Uh, on the infrastructure, uh, I would like to insist on, on one point. According to the latest figures from your control, we could reduce from a day to another the emissions of the entire European aviation sector by 10%, 10%, nothing less. It could have been realized since years with the achievement of the single European sky. At EBA, we sincerely hope that the solution will come with, will come with the conclusion of the SES 2 plus package, but it's not guaranteed at this stage and it wouldn't be acceptable because we are not talking here about technologies that do not exist yet, but about political will. It's in the hands of the government. There's a way to reduce the total emission by 10%. We would like to insist on that from a day to another. Now on the, the business aviation commitment on climate change, uh, a review is ongoing to ensure that the mechanisms within these commitments remain relevant. New technologies such as uh, electrification or hydrogen are considered and the commitment remains relevant 11 years after it was introduced. A successful deployment of sustainable aviation fuel is crucial in our sector's pursuit uh, to carbon neutrality. Sustainable fuel offers the greatest opportunity to significantly and quickly lower net life cycle carbon emissions from aviation. While the business aviation industry has proven that such fuels can be produced from a broad range of feedstocks, challenges remain that are impeding commercial development and therefore the uptake. In this regard, we support uh, the recent Refuel EU initiative from the European Commission towards creating a roadmap that would widen the research and development infrastructure, supply and use in Europe, uh, use of su sustainable fuel in Europe. Our key asks or policy options uh, would be the following, incentivizing the, in the entire self value and sub chain and additional research and development, increasing the multiplier under the, under the renewable energy directive from 1.2 to 1.5, prioritizing and allocating self to end users, including general and business aviation. So thinking about a scheme that is not designed only for airlines, but for all airspace users and monitoring sustainable fuel purchase and use to obtain recognition of offset, in offsetting mechanisms such as Corsia and ETS. So it should be seen as a whole uh, and we shouldn't dissociate all the measures in the basket that we are trying to put in place to reduce the, the footprint of the sector. So why, why Refuel EU is so important to us? Because increasing the uptake of SEF is critical to achieve our climate goals. This is a technology that exists, it is available, we need to implement it. In 2018, a coalition of international aviation associations, including EBA, started the Business Aviation SAF initiative developed to address an existing knowledge gap in our sector. At some point, many operators had questions on the safety and availability of sustainable fuel. And in response, uh, the SAF coalition published the Business Aviation Guide to Sustainable Aviation Fuel in 2018. The guide, has, the guide has been updated and republished last year, and we are confident that the operator know about SAF now, they know that it's safe, uh, and they know that it should be more and more available in the future, uh, thanks to uh, the, the policies and the legislations that should be developed. The SAF coalition has held a number of SAF demonstration events uh, to widen the knowledge and the uptake of SAF, this has been supplemented by further technical panels at ma major business aviation exhibitions and conventions in Europe and in the US. The SAF coalition also supported the World Economic Forum to supply S SAF for business aviation operators at Zurich Airport for their Dav Davos event in January 2020. I know it was at the time people were still meeting 
face to face, but in 2020 at the Davos uh, World Economic Forum, uh, sustainable fuel was available thanks to the work of the coalition and the support of the Swiss authorities. In addition to that, a working paper uh, on behalf of the business aviation sector was submitted to the ICAO General Assembly in 2019, calling on UN member states to recognize the activity we've put in place and to implement appropriate policies and incentives to support business aviation in the desire to increase the use of SAF. We are now organizing a virtual European Business Aviation SAF Summit to take place on the 23rd of March 2020. Uh, unfortunately, at this stage, I don't have uh, any concrete information to, to provide you with, but the information will be soon available on uh, eba.org. And of course, you are all invited to, to join this event. I'd like to conclude by mentioning a key milestone that we reached a few weeks ago with some of our colleagues from the aviation sector. I was mentioning the business aviation commitment on climate change earlier, but EBA, along with 20 other associations representing the entire aviation eco ecosystem, announced a joint commitment to work with policymakers to achieve net zero CO2 emissions by 2050. Net zero two emissions, which means the goals of the Green Deal. That's important. The commitment is part of a comprehensive collaborative report analyzing ways aviation can recover sustainably and more resiliently from the COVID-19 crisis while supporting the European Union's Green Deal objectives. I mean, you all know uh, the situation uh, the aviation sector is facing right now. This is a, a real disaster for our business. The investments at stake in our sector are huge. Uh, and, and those investments, those aircraft need to fly with passengers. Uh, to make those business uh, economically or financially sustainable. So this was one of the reasons also we drafted this, uh, uh, this report uh, in partnership with the Commission. So um, there's still a lot to do, I would say, but we are confident that if we all work together on developing and implementing the policies and technologies of tomorrow, we'll meet the targets of the Green Deal. Uh, with that, uh, I thank you uh, again, uh, the Intergroup and uh, Ms. Piraki for inviting us. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Grivet, for your uh, intervention. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Mr. Sotiris Raptis, uh, representing uh, EXA, which stands for the European Community of uh, Ship Owners Associations, where Mr. Raptis is the Director of Maritime Safety uh, and Environment. Uh, so, Mr. Raptis, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, may I kindly ask also our uh, speakers to follow to please uh, respect the allocated uh, time frame given, uh, seeing that we're running uh, some minutes behind in terms of today's agenda. I would like to even kindly ask you to please limit your interventions to perhaps eight minutes maximum, if possible. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. I, I will try to do my best. Thank you uh, for the invitation, Ms. Pirelli and the group. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to present um, our views. Um, let me first um, uh, stress um, the role of the IMO, of, of international approach. Shipping is a global business, and we do believe that the International Maritime Organization, which is a UN agency regulating shipping on safety and, and environment, that it's the only regulator that can guarantee a level playing field at global level. Shipping is carrying around 80% of global trade and it has made a significant progress over time. The IMO greenhouse gas emissions study found that um, shipping emissions are lower, were lower in, by 7% in 2018 compared to 2008, and that carbon intensity of the shipping sector improved by 30% the same period by the 40% increase in trade, in maritime trade. Having said that, um, we, uh, we understand that there is a political commitment under the, the European Green Deal um, to regulate uh, shipping among uh, other sectors. But we have to make sure when regulating shipping that, that regional reg regulation does not undermine this significant progress made at international level. The, the three, the four main legislative proposals we expect um, 
in fact, this, uh, the next six months is the new, uh, in, is the revision of the EU ETS and the inclusion of shipping under the EU ETS, an EU market-based measure. But equally important is the other proposal on the fuel EU maritime, which, which will address the, the demand side when it comes to maritime fuels, the revision of the alternative fuels infrastructure directive as well, and the revision of the renewable energy directive. We cannot get there without, um, if we don't bring into the picture um, infrastructure requirements and requirements for the fuel suppliers. But um, I, I will elaborate our position on the fuel EU in relation to the AFIT and RED uh, later on. I will turn quickly uh, to the EU ETS, the EU marketplace measure. We recently came up with uh, our position. Again, um, we firmly oppose any regional measures and an EU and the inclusion of shipping into the EU ETS. At the same time, we, we want to contribute constructively to this debate. And we want to put forward the framework conditions under which this significant progress made at the international level and the international negotiations will not be derailed. And we do believe that it's important that a fund is set up under any EU measures, under any EU market-based measure, or under the EU ETS. The backbone of our industry is SMEs, and the administrative burden of the EU ETS will be essential. We want a fund to minimize the administrative burden, a pooling system that will make it possible for companies to pay their fair share through a fund which could represent them in the ATS market. We want also to see the revenues invested back to the industry to facilitate the energy transition of the sector. In fact, 80% of the EU ATS allowances um, are invested through the national budget of the member states to facilitate the energy transition of land-based sectors. The electricity we use, renewable electricity we use in our households is financially supported by the revenues from the EU ETS allowances. And we want to see the same for the shipping sector. But this is possible only through a sector-specific fund. That's why we insist on the need to, to establish a market-based measure fund under any EU measures. Again, it's important not only for the use of the revenues, it's not only important to facilitate the energy transition of the sector, it's equally important to minimize the administrative burden. Uh, the, other, uh, the other main point we want to raise under uh, the EU ETS is the scope of any, um, any EU market-based measure. We want to see a scope limited to the EU MRV system which is up and running since 2018. And we also want to see a phase-in period. The EU ETS for shipping will be probably one of the most difficult exercises for uh, the EU policymakers. We're talking about thousands um, of operators, of ships inst slash installations. It depends which will be the responsible entity for the emissions. But anyway, we are talking about thousands of companies. For the sake of comparison, the, the operators, aviation operators covered by the ETS are around 500, if I'm not mistaken. We want to see a phase in period in, during which um, the EU policymakers and regulators will test the waters and will be able to identify any shortcomings um, to cover what, what that means, covering part of the emissions in the first period of the system and going gradually up to 100% of emissions. But I'm turning to the fuel EU maritime conscious of the time. Um, our concern under the fuel EU maritime proposal is that the Commission uh, will address the fuel alone without taking into account other efficiency improvements, without taking into account the overall energy performance of ships. And we we would like to see measures encouraging technical and operational efficiency measures. 
We need to pick the emissions of the sector as soon as possible. We don't have time to waste. And we need to incentivize, among, um, among uh, other initiatives, uh, operational and efficiency measures, including ships that, uh, including uh, speed. Uh, there are ships that lower their speed, that um, there are ships that they install better technologies. This should be taken into account under a standard in the fuel EU maritime. The right place to regulate fuels is the Renewable Energy Directive, um, which addresses the fuel supplier. And there we can discuss about the multiplier, about uh, sub-target for specific fuels. Anyway, for shipping, it's important that we encourage drop in fuels um, among other clean fuels. And for AFIT, we need also to, to discuss seriously about the requirements uh, for infrastructure. We cannot get there without, um, uh, we need to make sure that the infrastructure is, av is available in the ports as well. I will leave it there and uh, thank you for your attention. I would be really happy to, uh, to answer any questions and to participate in the discussion with the other panelists. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Raptis, for your remarks. Our next speaker is uh, Ms. Fabian Goinesh uh, from uh, Michelin. Ms. Goinesh is uh, head of EU office at Michelin, and as such, uh, she follows EU policy closely, specifically with regards to mobility and also the regulatory framework for vehicles and tires. Uh, so, Ms. Goinesh, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see very well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, first of all, thank you very much for this uh, invitation, Mrs. Pirakis, and of course the EDCD team, um, and to provide me uh, with the opportunity to give the Michelin's view on this uh, key topic, which is uh, decarbonization of transport. As you know, Michelin provides tires to every kind of vehicles from bicycles to buses, uh, aircraft to um, lorries. But today I will focus more on uh, road transport. Um, we all know that uh, decarbonization of mobility is a necessity and that, of course, uh, zero emission mobility will be uh, at the core of this uh, movement. Uh, if we if we go back in history for a little while, uh, we can see that Michelin has started to provide tires to electric vehicles as early as uh, the end of the 19th century. You can see here uh, the electric car called La Jamais Contente, uh, never happy car. Um, and um, some of the issues which are at the center of our debate today that uh, we've been uh, discussing already, the question of uh, availability of charging points was also underlined uh, back then. If you have a look at this guide that you can see here, it is the Michelin Guide edition 1901, so 120 years old. And the guide provided with uh, the list of um, recharging points uh, for uh, electric vehicles back then. Um, so as you can see, uh, Michelin has been involved in the question of um, e-mobility for more than a century. But uh, uh, if we get back to um, today's and our future, tires still have a major role to play uh, in uh, the development of zero emission vehicles. Indeed, one of the um, key questions linked to zero emission vehicle is, one, is the question of their autonomy. And this is where the energy efficiency of tires uh, can contribute um, heavily. Because indeed, one part of the energy that is needed to uh, basically move a car is related to tires. It is called uh, the rolling resistance of the tires. That's as you can see, one of the uh, forces that uh, contribute to energy consumption of a vehicle, like um, aerodynamic, uh, for example. So because of this impact on energy consumption of the vehicle, rolling resistance of tires is regulated in the EU, both uh, with a minimum performance threshold 
end with a grading and labeling system to help uh, consumers choose the best performing tires. As you can see uh, here, this is the, uh, the EU uh, sticker. So when it comes to um, zero emission uh, vehicles, designing tires with a low rolling resistance performance allows the decrease of the energy that is used for the vehicle and that translates into more autonomy. Um, for example, gaining the equivalent of a class uh, on the label, shifting from one letter to another, translates into 3 to 4% of autonomy for a passenger car and 4% uh, for a bus. Um, of course, the transition to zero emission mobility um, is a necessity to achieve the goal of climate neutrality. Um, and uh, the need to foster uh, the use of zero emission vehicles is a key lever. It is uh, uh, at the core of the sustainable and smart mobility strategy, as it was uh, said by uh, Mr. Ritters earlier. Uh, but if we consider the challenge ahead of us, it is paramount also to work on all the potential levers that we have. So not only fostering the adoption of those zero emission vehicles, which is key, but also ensuring that we make the best of the conventionally powered vehicles that are on the road and also lower their CO2 emissions uh, as much as possible. And this is where tires, again, uh, have a contribution to make. Because if uh, we choose the best performing tires when it comes to energy efficiency, um, this contributes uh, to uh, lowering uh, CO2 emissions of the vehicles because tires contribute uh, between 20 and 30 percent uh, of the conventionally powered vehicle CO2 emissions. So the, the choice of tires in terms of rolling resistance matters. So what do we need to go for those uh, best performing tires? Well, there are some tools like green public procurement, which are a strong signal and of course incentivizations to, to fleets uh, is also needed. Some countries in Europe have done it uh, efficiently and maybe uh, recovery funds uh, and recovery plans could help to go uh, further. So the approach to decarbonization of mobility must be holistic. We must use all the possible levers and this is also because Michelin has uh, this uh, global view on decarbonization that the company has been um, involved for uh, quite a while on hydrogen uh, mobility. Michelin started to do uh, research and development on uh, hydrogen systems 15 years ago. Um, this translates uh, today into uh, a joint venture with the company Foresia to produce fuel cells and the involvement into concrete projects uh, such as zero emission uh, valleys. This is driven by the conviction that clean hydrogen will be a strong contributor to the decarbonization of mobility along with battery electric uh, vehicles and notably for light duty and heavy duty vehicles. Um, in order to achieve the success of such vehicles, uh, we need to work um, on different levers. They've been, uh, they've been quoted already, uh, market uptake. Um, it's been um, it's written in the in the mobility strategy that uh, we the Commission wish to achieve uh, 80,000 zero emission lorries by 2030. To achieve that, um, incentivizations of the users to make the investment attractive will be necessary, but also uh, to make sure that uh, for a user the total cost of ownership of investing in a zero emission. Um, uh, truck is uh, interesting and of course it is key uh, for the user to be able to use this kind of vehicles in the same uh, way as the conventionally powered vehicles thus again uh, the infrastructure its availability uh, will be key and we hope that the revision of the uh, alternative fuel infrastructure directive and the um, will help boost the deployment uh, of the charging points both for battery electric vehicles and uh, hydrogen vehicles uh, throughout uh, Europe. Uh, Michelin really believes uh, in an ecosystemic approach to make this reality happen and that's why of course uh, we welcome very much the creation of the Clean Hydrogen Alliance 
uh, to achieve that. And when we talk about a coalition of actors, um, last November, there were actors of the fuel cell and hydrogen mobility value chain who has proposed to, to work and to launch uh, 1, 100,000 fuel cell uh, heavy duty vehicles by 2030 and uh, 1,500 fueling uh, stations. So in conclusions, um, achieving decarbonization of mobility is a necessity and it will require using all existing levers, notably uh, when it comes to uh, road transport. It is critical to ensure the market uptake of zero emission mobility solutions, incentivization of uh, vehicles for chase, availability of infrastructures and ecosystem work to deploy zero, um, zero emission um, region. But we should not forget to make uh, the most of the conventionally powered vehicles to ensure that uh, we lower the CO2 emissions as much as uh, possible throughout the life of the vehicle. And here, uh, tires have a strong role to play. Um, and finally, we believe, and uh, I've heard colleagues um, say the same, that uh, we must work in ecosystem, gathering all solutions and all stakeholders uh, so that we ensure that we go for this uh, decarbonized mobility that we need to achieve the climate transition. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Fabian, for your uh, for your remarks. Uh, before we proceed with uh, Ms. Poliskanova, which is our next speaker, let me just uh, give, uh, and please excuse me for that, let me just give a fresh uh, twist in today's agenda with uh, introducing Ms. Paulus. Uh, who I know would have to leave soon for an event for a, a European Parliament meeting. Uh, Ms. Paulus is uh, an MEP for the Greens political group, uh, but also a key member in the Committee on uh, Environment, Public Health and Food Safety, as well as a substitute member in the Committee on Industry, Research and Energy, ITRE, but also the Committee on uh, Transport and Tourism. So I think her expertise really uh, brings together all the elements of today's discussion. So Ms. Paulus, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for giving me the floor. Thank you very much for inviting me in the first place. I think it's very important that we have a cross-party intergroup working on mobility issues because they are so closely interlinked with all other issues, with environment, with trade, with people's rights, with um, travel, with education. So we have for all this, we need mobility. And I really think it is a right there must be a right for mobility, but in my view, it must be a right for sustainable mobility, a sustainable mobility which does not no longer cross the planetary boundaries and which does no longer pollute our environment because that's what it's doing right now. I'm I'm very sorry to say so, but we cannot we cannot just ignore that. We have this enormous impact from emissions from transport and we've already heard something about mitigation pathways also on public transport where i have visited some very promising examples in my home country in germany because of course all member states are facing the same um, challenges when it comes to reducing the emissions from transport and i think it's good that the commission finally updates the 2011 white paper on sustainable transport, but still I was pretty disappointed to read that um, the SSMS does not try to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. So when are we going to be climate neutral? How are we going to be climate neutral in 2050 if there are still transport emissions? Because we will have inevitable emissions, for example, from agriculture, which will be hard enough to mitigate. So we should aim for zero emissions in the sectors where it is possible. And for this, we must not make the mistake to switch from one fossil fuel to another fossil fuel. I have heard a lot from people saying, well, we, couldn't we just use natural gas which I would like to call fossil gas because that's in 90% of the of the cases um, in order to lower our impact when it comes to um, NOx particulate matter because of course gas burns more cleanly than other um, other fossil fuels but still that would be investment 
and a technology that would have to be exchanged eventually in order to become carbon neutral. So why don't we use technologies which can stay, which are here to stay also in a climate neutral world? And I would like to have, have some more words on shipping because I'm the rapporteur on the MRV file that um, my predecessor has just spoken about. And I think that we could, we are not really, um, we're not really on the same page here, I'm very sorry, <laughs> because I believe that we have to decarbonize shipping as quickly as possible. And you, you have said it yourself and you know it very well, ships are sailing the oceans for at least 25, if not 30 years. So if we want to be carbon neutral by 2050, we should not go building fossil, fossil fuel ships for much longer because that are also emissions that must be mitigated. And we had Inger Anderson from the UN Environment Program as guest in our environmental committee in December, and she presented the UN Emission Gap Report. And she um, had a very impressive graph there showing how emissions are going to evolve if the appropriate action as lined out in the National Energy and Climate Plans is taken. And um, according to the actions which are promised now, the remaining carbon budget in 2050 would be eaten up by 60% from aviation and shipping combined. So it's clear that those sectors have to do a lot more than they have done in the past. And while I believe that um, extending the ETS to shipping cannot be the only measure because the avoidance costs are so much higher when it comes to maritime transport as opposed to industry or electricity projection. It can be a suitable tool, firstly, to raise money, as you have said, and to put the money in an ocean fund for research and development of sustainable maritime transport and um, helping member states, helping small and medium enterprises to do the transition. And secondly, you can set the right signal. And you said it's very complicated to do something like that. And we need a period of, of um, introduction because it was so difficult with aviation. Well, but aviation got free allocations and that, that was what made it so difficult. In shipping, we know exactly the CO2 emissions because we have the MRV data. So all we have to do is we have to count the CO2 emissions, which we are already doing. We have to issue the respecting certificates for <laughs> auction, and then we can use the money we have raised to decarbonize your sector. And I, I agree with you, shipping is incredibly important. It's the most efficient uh, sort of transport, but still it cannot have a free ride. And I um, I would like to give the floor to Ms. Atuk now because I will have to leave. I'm very sorry because we have the next Envy meeting coming up and we will talk about Brexit, which will not leave us for a very long time, this issue, I believe. And I think the, the implications of Brexit for the transport sector are also pretty difficult. Thank you very much for having me and thank you for this important event. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Paulus. Mr. Ertug, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, hello all together and Happy New Year to all of you. Thanks a lot for this uh, invitation. It's my pleasure once again to be with you. And I, we have heard so many experts uh, today and um, so many things have been said and I'm always very interested in that, what Mr. Ruitas uh, is going to say because we worked uh, on the transport and the 10T legislation uh, eight years ago together. And I know that he is um, doing really good things when it comes to, to, to the future uh, policy. Uh, what I want to say is, uh, firstly, we have to think about how to shape the social ecological future. Um, I, I would like to emphasize the social ecological future because I have sometimes a little bit of the impression that uh, we're just talking about the, the ecological future, but we have to take the people with us. And this is, uh, from my angle, one of the most important things. Um, when it comes to that, I want to, to, to write down two main goals. First of all, as I said, um, decarbonization of the mobility is only possible through transformation of Europe's leading industries. I'm totally confirmed, I'm totally convinced about this. 
and we have to do this. Uh, we have to go this way. The second main goal, uh, which is maybe the social side, social industrial side, we have to go for a Euro world's leading markets for connected and autonomous driving. And I think this is not a, um, a secret when I say that that the European Union has the potential for it, but we have to do more when it comes to this um, uh, goal. The Commission Smart and Sustainable Mobility Strategy um, is a good step into this direction. I firmly believe this. And uh, this strategy, uh, I, I don't know if Mr. Reuters has mentioned that entails more than 80 initiatives from the Commission, which has been announced a um, few weeks ago in the end of 2020. When we look to the first pillar of this strategy, which is dealing uh, only with decarbonization, I think it's not necessary to reiterate that the transport sector is responsible for more than 27% of the EU's greenhouse gas emissions, so I can jump over this. Um, and when we look into this first pillar of this uh, strategy, we see very important um, pieces of legislation, uh, and this goes hand in hand. We have to uh, we have to do them all in um, horizontally when it comes to the CO2 standards for cars and vans, and also for trucks, which will be of crucial importance when it comes to the CO2 emissions um, of these kind of uh, vehicles. Uh, on the other hand side, as Mrs. Paulus said, we have to think about um, uh, a clever way on broadening the scope of the ETS which makes also sense uh, towards the aviation and uh, the, the maritime sector, and not to forget the Euro 7 regulation. The Euro 7 regulation will be one of the key legislations as well, because this is, um, <clears throat> or no, uh, this is important, and one more legislation will be key as well, which is this very often called uh, AFIT directive, the Alternative Fuels Infrastructure Directive, um, where I have several times heard from the Commission that they are thinking about uh, on a regulation, which would really make sense um, because of different reasons, but I don't want to go into this. These are issues uh, uh, we can, we can uh, speak about it in the later stage. When I look to the second part of this strategy, I see the revision of major legislatives or legislative frameworks in the transport sector, such as the, as I said, the 10 regulation. Um, incredibly good proposal eight years ago by the Commission. Um, and uh, as I always say, the biggest problem in the European Union are their member states, and we have to think about how to uh, convince them that they should forward, go forward hand in hand with the European Parliament's ambitious goals. And when we talk about um, um, legislative frameworks, how to revise them, we have to think about the CITS directive as well, which is included into the second part of this uh, strategy of the Commission. Um, slot and airport regulation will have also an impact on this um, main goal and uh, the license directive as well, but I expect they are uh, important, but not in that sense, uh, not in that um, uh, volume, as I said before, when it comes to the CO2 emission targets. Um, and when you, when we look into this strategy, we also see, and I'm I'm absolutely a fan of it. I have to I have to be 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 honest, which is the AI roadmap for mobility. I expect so many things, so many um, new ideas on this roadmap for mobility. And that goes maybe to the second big goal of the European Union, how to become um, a worldwide leader in autonomous and connected driving and this technology. Um, so I, I have praised the European Commission uh, very much, but now I have to say um, also a little bit uh, negative issues when it comes to the strategies. When it, when it comes to the strategy, um, all the headlines are there, all the legislation is there which has to be um, pointed out, but I have a little bit the impression that the ambitious, that the ambition is a little bit lacking behind. Why I'm saying that when we look into this, um, into the um, legislations, they have formulated, the commission have formulated some, some goals also for the future. Uh, just an example, two examples. When I look into the 10 network uh, legislation or the what we can expect from the European Commission, we see that even there, 
the completion of the 10T networks um, by 2050 is not new. And uh, even the, the previous legislation had the, the same goal to complete it until 2050. Um, now my question towards the commission would be, uh, what does it mean in the end, 2050, but on uh, what, what will be the content? What will be the new element of this 10 uh, network? And uh, in the past legislation, we tried to, to, to create a network linking all the major points like airports, conurbation areas, uh, seaports, and all, all this, uh, how to link them together. But in the meantime, we had the, 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 the diesel scandal in the meantime. We had Fridays for Future. We have the Paris Agreement. We, we see the, um, all the scientists giving us or showing us the catastrophic situation of our planet. That does mean, in my eyes, we have to be more ambitious when it comes to the 10T legislation. And uh, another example is when I, when I have read the strategy well, I have seen that the European Commission expects 30 million zero emission vehicles by 2030. Uh, in the first, uh, at first, at first glance, it sounds um, ambitious, but when we look to the different member states and their own national goals, we see that this 30 million is not really ambitious. When we look to Germany, for example, even Germany alone is expecting or estimating 15 million zero emission vehicles. Um, and I have the numbers of France, which is not so high, but also ambitious. So when I look to this, I would mean that um, that the ambitions of the European Commission is not so ambitious. Anyway, uh, finally, when it comes to the transport volume, which is the final point of, uh, of my intervention, uh, when we look to the rail freight traffic by 2050, the Commission's intention is how to double it. But to be honest, when we talk with all the uh, experts, we see that the transport volume will double by 2050. So that does mean the Commission's announcements means uh, a status quo at best. These are only three examples where I want to um, have a little bit more amb ambitious goals. And we as the European Parliament, I hope with my, co uh, with my colleagues, Piraki and others, we will be more um, motivated or higher motivation in order to to uh, deliver ambitious, more ambitious goals. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ertug, for your intervention. And once again, on behalf of the Secretariat of the Intergroup, uh, apologies for this uh, twist with regards to today's agenda. It seems that it was the only way to ensure the participation of uh, Ms. Paulus and Mr. Ertug. Uh, so thank you very much for your kind understanding. Uh, at this stage, it's with pleasure to introduce Ms. Poliskanova. Uh, who is uh, the Senior Director for Vehicles and E-Mobility at Transport and Environment, where she currently leads the Clean Vehicles Program, including policy and projects on car emissions and e-mobility. Uh, Ms. Poliskanova, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks very much. And thank you for having Tia Niet at this event. I, I sincerely hope that some of you are still here and you're still listening and, and very grateful for, for that. Um, so very briefly, for those of you that don't know, we are the largest Europe's green transport group, and we represent over 60 sustainable and environmental NGOs across Europe. Without further ado, I'll, I'll, I'll go straight, straight in. 2020 has been the year of the electric car in Europe. Driven by the European car CO2 standards, we have to give credit to them. They brought investments, they finally brought the supply of these vehicles, and the market absolutely boosted this year, despite the pandemic. We actually expect more than 10% of all vehicles sold to have a plug across Europe in 2020. We don't yet have the full data. The data you see here is for the, for the first three quarters. What is important to say is even though the shares are very high in Western Europe and they are lower in Eastern Europe, what you can see is that the growth rates in Eastern Europe are higher, which means that the growth is also there. And the biggest growth was actually seen in member states like Latvia and Slovakia, for example, so it's a European phenomenon. The electric car is, is really here. Some of them are not real electrics, they're fake electrics, they're plug-in hybrids. So there's a lot of job to do there to really go still to zero emissions. Now, what does it mean for the review, which is coming this year? 
what we have today, especially given how fast the situation has developed and how successful the electric car market is, is that the current CO2 standards are really not up for speed and they're very much, uh, if we don't change the standards, we will actually see stagnating vehicle market in Europe. What we need to do is what you see on your right, uh, the green line, where if we want to be at full climate neutrality in 2050, we need to be at zero from new cars in 2035, which means that both 2025 and 2030 targets need to be increased. But of course, we're not only here talking about cars, vans and of course other other means are all very important and in fact vans are not following the success story of the car that we saw this year Vans emissions are completely off track in fact they have grown by almost six percent from 1990 levels and i'm sure some of you here will uh, will remember one or two parcels that you all ordered during COVID times that was delivered by a polluting van in your city Shares of electric vans are really, really low, so it's really time to put vans back on track. We don't just need higher CO2 targets, we also need specific um, sales targets for zero emission vans, for electric vans. So at least half of all market is electric by 2030, which is what our cities need to finally have clean air and clean streets. Now, again, electrification does not stop at the lighting sector. Cars. Please, please for, uh, don't, don't, don't forget that it's a myth that you can't electrify trucks. You can, and it is already happening. All the major manufacturers are bringing electric trucks on the market as we speak. And you can see here on the right all the different models and how many are coming in the coming years. In the urban and regional delivery, electric, direct electric, battery electric truck will be the winner. And in the long haul, the competition is still open and there will be electric and hydrogen trucks. But what we need is to ensure that in Europe we have supply and production of these vehicles as well as infrastructure. So the review, which is coming in 2022 of truck CO2 standards, is paramount here. A few words on carbon pricing and the European Emissions Trading Scheme. Um, carbon pricing is a crucial climate element, but we need to be honest about what it can and cannot do. It can raise revenue. It's a great instrument to raise revenue for, for member states or, or technologies. It can also bring people to the street to protest if the fuel prices are increased and there are no alternatives for people who today rely, for example, on secondhand, less fuel efficient cars. In fact, car CO2 or vehicle CO2 standards are much better because the focus on the market that can afford new cars rather than other parts of the market. There's many things that carbon pricing cannot do. Very importantly, it doesn't bring you completely new technology breakthroughs or new technologies. If it did, Europe, not China, would be leading the electric car race. It also will not deliver the CO2 savings in the road transport sector that we need to 2030. And that's really important. This study here comes from Cambridge Econometrics and shows that even at the 90 euro per ton carbon price, the additional CO2 reductions to 2030 are negligible. They will simply not, such a measure will not help Europe to actually increase its ambition as it needs to meet its 55% target by 2030. So it's not a good tool for the road transport. However, it is an absolutely paramount tool for sectors such as aviation and shipping, where we don't have anything else tangible today. The, um, on the aviation side, um, most allowances are actually for free. There's no fuel tax. Um, on the shipping side, it's not today covered by any emissions regulations in Europe. It's simply not acceptable that as Europe goes to climate neutrality, two of huge contributors to climate don't do their fair share. And in fact, COVID is an opportunity to reset the way we do things in this sector. I would like to stress here that actually, contrary to what the industry is saying, adding shipping to the ETS will have negligible costs actually compared to the tanker costs. You can see here that on a standard container from China to Europe, you would only add eight euros per that cost on around a thousand euros that it costs today. I would say it's a fair price worth paying to aid the climate emergency that we're all facing. Climate, um, sorry, carbon pricing is not, however, the only tool we need to decarbonize aviation and shipping. 
We absolutely need ambitious fuel policies, which are essential, but they need to bring the right type of clean fuels. As an environmental movement, we have already been via uh, through one biofuels fiasco, which caused global deforestation. My plea to all of you are listening and especially politicians here with us today, please don't repeat the past mistakes. Biofuels are not a sustainable option. They're not the solution. There is simply not enough stock to scale it up in a sustainable way. What we need to focus instead are renewable hydrogen derived fuels, e-fuels for aviation, as well as hydrogen and ammonia for shipping. And that has to be mirrored in Refuel EU, Fuel EU initiatives, and really importantly, in the Clean Hydrogen Alliance, which today focuses too much on the road transport sector, but it actually needs to have industry players to focus where hydrogen is needed, so in aviation and shipping. What else can we do? What other opportunities are there? Well, there is a lot. First of all, there's 60% of the cars market today, and that's how many cars are sold to companies, so fleets, company cars that can go electric already today. It's not purchase price, it's the total cost of the vehicle that makes sense. It's driven by things like taxation, for example, and there already in, well, today, actually in 2020, a battery electric vehicle was the best option. So we must really ensure that 60% of the market goes electric, goes zero emission now when it can. And there we need a European fleet regulation to push all companies in this direction and follow in the footsteps of some already. For example, there was an announcement by Free now recently to, to that effect. We also have to do much, much more on infrastructure. That's been mentioned by a number of speakers already, uh, so I won't spend too, too long here, but we need to make sure that AFIT is fit for the 21st century. So it needs to become zero emissions infrastructure regulation that focuses on charging and on hydrogen. We need to learn from past mistakes. And it was great to hear from a number of speakers today that we really finally need to have binding targets. We also need to have a single charging market for all Europeans. Consumer needs to be first. That means that it should be easy, fast uh, to install, use and pay for infrastructure. It needs to be where charging mostly will take place, so in buildings, private charging, as well as in things like commercial properties. So you go to the gym or a supermarket, and while you're there, you can top up your battery. That's an effective solution for the 21st century society. It's really important to stress that we also need a plan for trucks. We can't electrify them. Companies want to do it, but there is no infrastructure. Urban nodes, so urban areas are really key at that. And we really hope that the new regulation that will be proposed this year will actually set targets for public and destination charging at urban hubs. And this is my last slide, just to stress that there is, uh, we all need to act at all levels to make this a reality. People need to do their share. Cities need to do a huge share to go to sustainable mobility, but so do governments. There is no sustainable mobility in Europe without national commitment. And that national commitment today sits in the effort sharing regulation that sets national targets for including transport. That is what gets governments to do their share and to have additional national action, be it around infrastructure, low emission zones, taxation to drive behavioral change by people, or even to drive their own support for ambitious regulations at European level. So let's not forget that. And my plea to all of you is to make sure that we strengthen those national targets in the 2021 review, but not get rid of them. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thanks a lot for having TME here. Look forward to any questions if there are any. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Poliskanova, for your remarks, but also for your uh, policy recommendations at the end of your intervention. Uh, last but definitely not least, uh, in today's event, it's with great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Mr. Matsula, who is the Executive Director of the Community of European Railway and Infrastructure Companies. Uh, I would also say, uh, highlight, echoing uh, what was previously mentioned, that with 2021 being the European Year of Rail, uh, this only serves to highlight rail's key importance as the backbone of zero carbon mobility in Europe. So, Mr. Matsula, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much. I would like to present my also my slide. I don't know if you can get it. Uh, the authorization to go. Sorry. I don't have the authorization to share the slides, please. Hello. Uh, hello, Mr. Matsala. My colleague Regine will now provide you the opportunity. Thank you. Mr. Matsala, I just send it to you. You should have received it now. I did not, sorry. So, but uh, uh, yeah, I did not receive. I, I will continue without unless I receive it now. But, um, so, I don't know if you see my screen. Uh, okay, I receive it now. Do you see it? Hello? No, we cannot see it yet. Sorry. If you prefer, I can share my screen so we can see it directly from my screen. Please go. So please, uh, the first slide, uh, if you can start with this. So as we said, uh, 20, 2021 is the European Year of Rail. And uh, of course, we are very proud by what the Parliament and the Council has decided and to, I would say, recognize the role of the, of the rail for, uh, for the Europe. Unfortunately, we are in the middle of the COVID crisis, so it will be difficult also for us to fulfill what uh, everybody is expecting for us to do. But let's hope that the situation will improve and we'll be able to provide our contribution there. Um, Regine, if you can show the first slide, uh, I'm representing the CR, CR, Community of European Railways. We have more than 70 members around the, in our association, representing all the European countries. Yes, the second one. So you can see around, probably most of you can recognize at least some of these uh, symbols. There are the companies that are members of the Community of European Railways. All the countries, the European countries are represented. And in this association, you find 71% uh, of the European rail network, 76% of the rail freight business, and 92% of the passengers' operations in Europe. Um, the next one, please. Maria Spiraki, when you introduced the, the session, you highlighted the importance of transport. I fully agree with you. Uh, transport is an important enabler, a vital enabler for Europe, for the economy, for the industry, small and medium companies, for people, I would say for employment. But let's say that uh, is the only sector that unfortunately in the last 30 years has been able to increase their emissions. All the other sectors in Europe have reduced the emission transport is the only one. So as you, pro as you highlighted, that we need to think how to improve or to do better things here. In this slide, you have the uh, railways credential. Let me say, I would say they are incredible if you can uh, just compare. We emit nine, nine times less uh, than a road concerning freight transport or aviation concerning passengers. Yeah times more efficient than road. Uh, we consume only 2% of the European energy, while we are providing about 18% of the freight and 8% of the passenger transport. If you look at these credentials, you will also wonder why we should not push more for railways. This is what the title of the slide is a ready-made solution for decarbonization. decarbonization. This is also what uh, makes reference the Commission has included in their strategy, strategy for sustainable mobility. I think it will be important to get more railways around you. It will not be the solution for all the problems, but certainly we can improve a lot the situation. Let me say also the situation in other parts of the world, we have a much higher market share. In the US, rail freight is more than 40% potential market share. If you go to Japan, high-speed passenger or passenger transport is much higher than Europe. So there is possibility and there are examples how to improve our situation. 
it's not just the, the I would say it's not just question of uh, credentials or environment. If you look about the external cost, so the congestion cost, the safety, the accidents, uh, how many people are, have accidents in the motor transport, you can see that also here rail is three times better both than aviation and road. The next slide, please. Uh, the European Mobility Strategy, we have a few targets concerning railways, but they are, I would say, quite important, we like to underline them. Doubling the high-speed rail traffic by 2030 and tripling by 2050 is not something simple, so we need to do something to get there. Increase the market share of rail freight by 2030 and doubling by 2050. And then completely, this is that, uh, what also Ismail had to say, not very ambitious, completing the multimodal smart network by 2030, the comprehensive network by 2050. This is how the objectives, I would say, of 10 years ago. So they should have been a bit uh, increased in there. Uh, I go to the next one, please. So to get to these objectives anyway, we need to do something. And uh, let me say there are at least three areas where we need to reflect and uh, especially at political level uh, act. First of, the first of all is about investment. And in order to complete the 10T network, we're still missing 500 billion euros. So this is something that uh, which is substantial. Uh, Europe is devoting 13 billion, so a lot of money is still missing to get there. And uh, so probably we need to reflect how to better create a better coalition between Europe, Europe investment and member states investment. We have been working for digitalizing railways for 25 years. Unfortunately, are also here the, the speed of investment has been not enough, not, not fast enough. We have done 10% of the network in 25 years, and I'm always saying it will take more than 200 years, 200 years to complete this. So we need different speed, different attention, put more, I would say, better organization, better governance and also invest a bit more there. And let me say we are in the verge of the most important investment program in Europe, the recovery and resilience facility, the recovery plan for COVID. I think that there, there should be objectives and targets how to achieve these climate neutral uh, goals. There we should find where the investment should go in the direction of what we want to achieve here. I think this is the most important, as I said, the most important investment program of Europe for the next 20 years and for the last 20 years too. I think we should not miss the point here. And we find some opening, but I think we will see in the next three years what will happen. I think the Parliament should probably consider to stay focused on this point. The second point that I want to raise is the level playing field. Uh, we would like to compete on equal, fitting, equal footing with road and aviation to make the best, the best of the investment that they are going there. Uh, the first directive under examination is your vignette. Parliament has been very ambitious. Council, I would say, much lower, but not so much. And uh, I'm afraid that here the conclusion will not be in line with the strategy to be climate neutral by 2050. So, we are missing the point here. The next coming is combined transport. I hope that the Commission will present a new proposal in combined transport in order to be able how to integrate road and rail because we need to cooperate to be multimodal. And I hope we get a new proposal also in this energy taxation and ETS. Let me say we pay VAT non international traffic, other most don't pay it. We pay fully ETS, all the electric. Uh, I would say rail is most electric, and through this is paying all the, the ETS. Last point is about European rail reforms. I would say here we had uh, four packages, and member of Trump Committee know very well. Now we need, just need to implement them. We are not looking for new reforms. Certainly, we will include in our activities railways more digital, mobility as a service, freight as a service will be part of what we are going to propose both to businesses and uh, to citizens and, and users. But we are not expecting major reforms already on the table. They need to be implemented, and this will be, 
I say. The end of my contribution. Let me say in summarizing that the goals of the mobility strategy for us in terms of high speed, in terms of rail freight are ambitious. For instance, we would like to see in the 10T that all the European capitals and all the major cities will be connected by high speed network. It will be impossible to get this result if the infrastructure will not be there. It's a concrete example. I understand it's a big investment, but I would say we bear fruit for the economy, we bear fruit for the environment. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Matsola, for your intervention. Uh, given the slight delay with regards to today's planning uh, and moving ahead with the Q&A session, just to notify you that I will be taking one, maximum two, perhaps, questions from the audience. Uh, with the first of those being uh, battery electric vehicles are making headlines, but hydrogen is also gaining momentum. This is a question for all speakers. So uh, how do you envisage tomorrow's mobility? And how do you think that battery electric vehicles and hydrogen fuel cells vehicles fit in? Please feel free to take the floor. Um, Spiraki, perhaps any other speaker. I think I think it is, it is a question for the experts and not for the politicians because we are trying to combine all the available uh, all the available options and all the available opportunities we have. But it is important for me first to have enough quantities of free hydrogen. And I think it is one of the priorities that we have to fulfill. And comparing with the ambitions that the Commission has already published, I think that we are lacking behind in this regard, especially for the mid-term milestone for 2024. And the second issue is the, the approach on the whole life cycle of batteries, especially because I th it is also important to revise the, the directives in order to in order to, to have a, a full life cycle approach here in the in the EU concerning the way that we use, uh, uh, reuse, and 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 finally recycle batteries. And uh, this is fully aligned with the the, the critical raw material that uh, that we we have to use here in. Uh, in, in, in the EU. Thank you. Yeah, Olivier was speaking. I, I just uh, agree <laughs> what we what we said. I think uh, they, they, this can they can be complementary, but yes, we have to insist that uh, hydrogen must be uh, carbon free, and it, there will not be uh, carbon free hydrogen everywhere in the same quantity. So that's the limit of uh, the complementarity. I would like maybe to, to add also very quickly to, to support what was said before, just to say that ultimately the whole economy needs to decarbonize. The whole economy will have to rely on renewable energy. So efficiency matters. We should do things optimally rather than oh, what is possible. And in that way, where we already have ready-made efficient solutions in road transport, that's direct electrification, that's batteries, we should continue improving them. But where today we can't yet electrify with batteries. In a way, that's where hydrogen should go, renewable hydrogen. And that's where we're talking about aviation, shipping, and maybe some parts of long haul trucking. So bat hydrogen should go where batteries cannot reach was something that The Economist written uh, last year. And I thought that was a very powerful summary of, of how the two should interact. And we say from the real perspective that we are, I would say, most electrified. In many countries, we are 100% already carbon neutral. Netherlands is carbon neutral, 100%. Switzerland and Austria are very close. And where we are using diesel in the small lines, we are certainly thinking already to hydrogen. And we started to introduce hydrogen power trains. And I think uh, we, we certainly will be able well before 2050 to be carbon free. I think indeed that, uh, as it has been said by colleague, the, the key word here is complementarity. I think we need all solutions possible. And uh, indeed, um, hydrogen, for instance, has a role to play in maritime, in aviation, long haul. Also, um, uh, also deliveries, more light duty. So the question is complementarity to achieve the goals of decarbonization. I, I would say, if I can add on, on behalf of the aviation sector, indeed com complementarity, and we see solution in a basket of measures, not one single solution. Um, at the horizon, 
2030, 2035, we will have um, hydrogen and, and electrical aircraft on the market. Uh, we might not be uh, at the beginning able to go from Brussels to New York with hydrogen or, or an electrical aircraft, but it will start slowly uh, with regional aircraft. Uh, but we, there, there are some very good projects uh, at, at Airbus that are quite um, advanced. Uh, they are really small electrical aircraft, uh, um, and, and so this is uh, this is this is the future of the aviation sector. We will have those type of uh, uh, this new generation of uh, aircraft, uh, yeah, in 10, 15, 20, 20 years. Uh, in the meantime, we will uh, use all the other. Uh, options that are on the table to reduce our footprint and uh, we are talking about sust uh, sustainable fuel uh, we are talking also about uh, offsetting sometimes uh, of, of offsets that are made by the companies themselves by passengers etc so we really see uh, reaching the goal uh, by you know using all type of, of measures to make sure that we are reducing year by year uh, our footprint Thank you very much. Uh, just perhaps uh, we can take a final question uh, but, uh, from the audience. I see yeah, Mr. Rabbit if, has if, if, his camera. Yeah. Yes. Very, very briefly, um, when it comes to shipping, the question is not if hydrogen and electricity will be part of the solution. Of course, they will be part of the solution, along with dropping fuels. A ship is, which is built today um, will, uh, will be at sea for the next 30 or 40 years. So we need also to take into account how the existing fleet will decarbonize as soon as possible. And uh, apart from the theoretical discussion about uh, the future, uh, how the um, future uh, fuel mix will look like, we need also to discuss about policy making. And when it comes to shipping, the whole attention of the Commission is on the fuel EU maritime, when we should also discuss about the revision of the Renewable uh, Energy Directive where we, can, we should address the requirements for the fuel suppliers when it comes to low or zero carbon fuels. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Raptis. Uh, just the final question for our speakers is, uh, reads out, decarbonization of transport is primarily about decarbonization of the energy used in transport. So if new hybrid ICE cars, uh, which stands for uh, internal combustion engine cars, could come with a contract for 100% renewable liquids fuel supply, shouldn't they also be described as climate neutral? This would also boost investment in low carbon and climate neutral liquid fuels for the benefit of all transport modes. To say that it is also a question uh, focusing on the experts, but uh, before we start concluding this, this very fruitful debate and very fruitful exchange of you, I would like just to remind to all of us that we have to take into account the affordability of the energy that we have and the affordability of the technology that we are providing because we are talking for the people and for the benefit of the citizens. I would like to very quickly maybe answer the question if I may. I would just say that uh, so maybe in theory, indeed, you can call it uh, a renewable uh, zero carbon fuel for a car, but at what cost? at what cost to the system and at what cost to the society. At a cost of five, six times more energy you would need to use for that compared if you just powered that car with a battery. And similarly, it's a lot, a lot more expensive. A battery car will cost the same as a petrol car in the next two or three years. On the other hand, we have lots and lots of industries that don't have today a decarbonization pathway and they need those fuels. So rather than crowding all into the car space, let's make sure we have solutions for each sector. So again, yes to zero carbon fuels, but in aviation and shipping. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Pilaki, Ms. Poliskanova. Uh, perhaps uh, seeing uh, no other reaction by our set of speakers for today, I will gladly provide the floor back to Ms. Piraki for her closing remarks. I know that also uh, you have a very tight agenda, so thank you very much for your flexibility. Once again, I would like to thank you all for the participation in this very interesting and very fruitful discussion concerning the way that we will transform our energy mix and our transportation within EU. 
I would like to insist on three points. The first one is that we have to join forces and to, to work together in different levels in order to have a holistic approach and in order to understand the specificities that we face in every in each case. For example, as Mr. Kodras has already provided to us some kind of information, the case of my home city Thessaloniki is quite different than the case of, of the city of Berlin, but uh, my colleague Jutta has uh, mentioned uh, uh, when it comes to Germany. And I think that it is important to take into account the different needs that we have to fulfill for the people and, of course, the different paces that the member states are now facing. So, the first one issue for us is to facilitate all in order to, to, to succeed the same goal. And the same goal is the decarbonisation of the, of the transport sector. The second issue concerns the way that we will use the new, the new the alternative fossil fuels and also the new technology. I insist on this, that we have to, to speed up in terms of technology by by supporting and by by funding uh, uh, adequate by have by, by providing adequate funding to to the research and innovation in order to have alternative fuels as soon as possible in order to have sufficient candidates of bring hydrogen as soon as possible in order to have sufficient batteries uh, with uh, a, a whole life set approach uh, as soon as possible. In this regard, I think that we can use all the available instruments that we have in the EU, including Horizon Europe, but not only this one. We have the Recovery and Resilience Facility, and we have also the MFF. It is this one unique uh, moment in, in, this, in the history, but we can uh, uh, use all together, we can join them, and we can use the, the wording of additionality as, as a concrete part practice. And the third one I would like to say is that uh, the, the existing legislation is, is not enough. We have to upgrade the existing legislation and we have to include all, all the sector in our efforts. Of course, taking into account the global level playing field, because it is important to understand, but by doing our job and by, 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 by facing and by targeting the, 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 final, uh, the final scope, which is the, to decarbonize our, our our continent by 2050, we, we have not uh, to, to undermine our competitiveness, especially in sectors like the maritime sector and the aviation sector, which are acting globally. So we are looking forward for our maybe next discussion after the adoption of the, of the, of the revision uh, uh, regulation when it comes to 10T and to 10E, and after the adoption of the, of the fifth PCI list, where, fifth European projects of common interest, which are, of course, very related to, to our discussion. Once again, thank you very much all and looking forward to our cooperation again. Thank you very much. Have a good evening from Brussels. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much on behalf of the European Parliament intergroup as well to all of our speakers and participants. Thank you, Ms. Piraki, once again for taking the lead. Uh, it's been a pleasure having this online event with all today with you all today on the key role of sustainable and smart mobility so very much looking forward uh, to the webinars to follow uh, until then all the best and uh, stay safe thank you very much thank you thank you, thank you. bye 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 bye, bye.